Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Paul went through huge hardships in life, so he was the right person to teach about spiritual warfare. Paul encourages us to put on the whole armor of God. Learn how to overcome difficulties and advance the kingdom of God amidst tough circumstances. Now, here's Hans. So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that you are with us, that you have called us to come to this conference this weekend. And we think that you have something very special in store for us uh, throughout these days. And now we pray to you, Heavenly Father, please send your wonderful Holy Spirit. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to come right now into this room, into our hearts. And we pray that you would um, uh, come to us and and, uh, enlighten our hearts, revive our spirits. And we thank you so much, Lord, that we will have the privilege of reading the Bible that is your own word, the word of God. And we pray to you, Holy Spirit, that you would just um, make that word uh, something that um, will speak to us into our lives in a very personal way this uh, morning. And we also are so thankful that you, Holy Spirit, you illuminate the face of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you, Jesus Christ, our beloved Savior, would uh, walk around here throughout this hour and and touch us and bless us and speak to us. Um, That we pray to you, Father, in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay. So we have 57 more minutes. And uh, what we are going to do is to talk about spiritual warfare. Um, It's a little bit hard for me as a Swede to say warfare, but I'll try. Warfare, warfare. Oh, well. And this, you know, is something that that might sound, um, you know, something that is very far above uh, a very special subject for, for perhaps some spiritual giants and and experts but what i have found out uh, as so many other christians is that spiritual warfare is really something that that the word of god wants to communicate and instruct us about all christians we all need this um because i think we all have struggle in our lives someone here without a struggle no okay we need to to learn more about this And the text I'm going to be uh, using is Ephesians, the letter to Ephesus, the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6 from verse 10. Chapter 6 from verse 10, I will be reading. And if you have another translation than I have, uh, I will be reading in English, not Swedish, I promise. Uh, But if you have another translation than I have, uh, don't become nervous because it was not in English to begin with. Okay, it was in Greek, and I will be commenting on that as we go. Um, And um, the thing about um, spiritual warfare, if we think about first Ephesus, you say Ephesus? Yeah, Ephesus. Ephesus, right. Uh, That was a city, right? In Jesus and Paul's day. And uh, It was an actual place, a physical place. And it's no coincidence, I think, that that Paul is writing about spiritual warfare to that very place, to the Christians who lived there. And I have had the privilege of visiting Ephesus uh, several times. I have been there myself with a guide, and I've also been teaching groups. And uh, Ephesus is an intriguing place, a fascinating place. 
And when I walked around there praying, listening to the guide, uh, when I walked around there also by, my, by myself with, with my Bible open, uh, trying to pray and understand what, what uh, the Bible had to say about Ephesus and, and, and through that to me, um, what I realized was that I was not only walking in the past. Because, you know, when you walk around in Ephesus, you really uh, have the sensation that you're walking around in the past because it's great ruins, lots of ruins left. And, and it's not a city nowadays. So it's only the ruins left. So you pretty much get the impression that you walk in the past, right? A city that was existing 2000 years ago. But what I found out was that I was walking in something that I think is maybe very close in the future for the Western world. So it's not only walking in the past, I was walking in the future. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about how life was in Ephesus for the Christians. Just shortly, uh, to give you a context to um, the text we're going to read. The first thing I want to say about that is pluralism. You know pluralism? Very many religions and philosophies came into Ephesus every day. It was by the sea 2,000 years ago. And the first thing that happened was that you, you stepped um, uh, into the, the city and you were agora in Greek. It was a big open marketplace. And there you could hear people preach about different religions, different messages, different philosophies uh, all over. It's not only 2013 that we have internet and so many religions and philosophies, you know, floating around, right? But that was the way life was then too. The second thing you can note about uh, Ephesus was that uh, they lived a life with pressure. Pressure. If you go to the theater in Ephesus, it has 24,500 seats. and when you come into the theater, you know, you, you, you're impressed. It's so big. It's beautiful. Uh, and the stage is, is um, way down and you sit above the stage looking down. And what you could see is that, that um, it's quite high uh, a ceiling above the stage before people could sit. It's a couple of meters up. And that was because they had wild animals there. It was not so good if a lion ate one of the spectators, right? And, and they had gladiators fighting with each other there also. And they had sometimes Christians who were thrown to the wild beasts. It's like one Christian pastor uh, I know uh, who lives in a part of the world where, where um, he is persecuted for his faith now and then. And he said like this to me. You know, Hans, um, where I live and where I work as a pastor, it's like living on a volcano. You never know when it's going to erupt. You're totally dependent on the Lord. That's how life is for Christians in many parts of the world, right? And that was the way life was in Ephesus. So no wonder that Paul felt led by the Holy Spirit to write to them about spiritual warfare, right? How to cope with pressure, how to deal with pressure. I don't know if you have pressure in your life. Well, I think this text wants to help us to, 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 to uh, um, live close to the Lord so he can help us with the pressure that we meet in our life. Amen? And then... We kind of get a little bit nervous. We walk out from the theater. All these things about wild animals and, and, and gladiators made us a little bit nervous. And, and we look uh, down on, on the street and we see hearts carved into the street. They're still there 2,000 years later. Hearts. And we kind of think, well, this was at least something nice. Hearts. That's great. That has to speak about love. Well, the problem was that these hearts, they were showing the way to a big house, very big, in the center, very center of the city. And I think the English word is brothel. You say brothel? Yeah. So, you know, 
Today we say, oh, it's so tough to be a Christian today. You know, there's so many temptations. As soon as we go out on the internet, there's so many temptations. Sure. Well, you know, in Ephesus, being a Christian at that time, in that city, naked everywhere. <laughs> and... You know all these statues? Have you seen statues from that time, 2,000 years ago? They, they, they look like, uh, they, they look very, you know, stylish. Could you say that? You know, they're, they're, they, they have this gray, white, stone color. Well, they didn't have that color in Paul's day. No, no, no. Almost all of them had color. Vivid colors. And the reason for these statues in like 80% of the cases was to um, arouse people sexually. So, um, two ways that I think the devil wants to come against us. Two ways. The first one is oppression. Right? Applying pressure to us. But that's only like an, uh, uh, um, the, that's the worst option for the evil one because that uh, often sanctifies us. But the other way is seduction. Seduction. And I'm not standing here as a fanatic. Don't get me that way. I'm just telling you a little bit about the village, the, the city that received the, the big text about spiritual warfare. Okay, are you awake? Let's read from the text. Ephesus, um, Ephesians, the letter to Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10. I read. It goes like this. Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes. You say schemes? Yeah, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Amen. And, you know, it starts in a wonderful way because um, it starts with uh, telling us that we shall be strong in the Lord. And, and it also says that, that um, he has power and um, uh, the word that is used in Greek is dynamis. And we have that, right? Dynamite. So Paul says that we have dynamite uh, in the Holy Spirit. And Paul also says in Ephesians chapter 1 that we have the gift to receive as Christians the same power, the same Holy Spirit that was at work when Jesus was risen from the dead. That's kind of encouraging, right? Um, and and uh, I don't know how it is in Canada, because I, I, I'm only once a year in Canada. But, but uh, you know, in Sweden, the Christians sometimes can, can think like this. Um, that um, 2,000 years ago, it was like, you know, lemonade? It's really strong lemonade? Almost too strong lemonade, really sweet, lots of taste. Uh, it was like really strong lemonade, you know, lots of Holy Spirit. And then throughout these 2000 years, more and more water has been added. So they, today we get like a, 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 a you can say a, a weaker version. It's watered down. Is that true? Is it the word of God? No. Paul says that we have the same Holy Spirit that awoke Jesus from the dead. So be strong in the Lord is his first um, piece of advice to us here. And then after that, um, he tells us that we can put on the whole armor of God 
the whole armor of God. We have an armor that we can put on every day, every day. And why should we do that? Well, now Paul starts to speak about the enemy, the enemy. Um, in the Second World War, there was a general called Rommel. He was um, uh, a German, but um, there was a, a general from the Allies who uh, led the Allied forces down in uh, northern uh, Africa. I think his name was uh, MacArthur. Montgomery, there you go. MacArthur is a teacher I've listened to. Montgomery. John MacArthur. <laughs> Montgomery. And Montgomery, he had something in his tent. He had a, a poster in his tent. And you know what that poster showed? Was it a flower? It was in the desert. That would have been kind of nice, right? Was it a waterfall? That would have been nice in the desert, right? No, the poster showed a picture of General Rommel. His opponent, his main enemy. And why did he have that? Was he crazy? No, no, no. He often stood and looked at that poster and he did it to kind of try to understand what the enemy was about to do. So he could counteract it. And that was the way he won the war. And I think that we receive texts in the Holy Bible that deals with struggle, that deals with the evil one, not to scare us, but to inform us so we can, can uh, counteract the enemy. And um, let's see what the enemy uh, is about. It says like this, uh, again, verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, the evil one, he is defeated, right? He's only a bad loser. He has already lost. In Revelation chapter 5, it says that the lamb and the lion of Judah, Jesus Christ, has won. Not leading, not is going to win. We hope he will win. No, he has won. And God is always, has always been, and will always be the almighty one. Right? So God has already won the victory. That's kind of good news. So the evil one, he's just a bad loser. That's why he has such a bad temper. He's a very bad loser. And, and you know what? I have lots of questions in my life and things I struggle with, and I don't understand everything that the Lord allows, right? But it is scriptural to say that the evil one cannot do anything that God doesn't allow him to do. I have lots of question marks and struggles. I won't know the true meaning of everything until I get to heaven. But still, scripture says that. Okay? And the evil one now, um, still, he is alive and at work. Right? And you know what? He's smarter than us. He's smarter than us. So we need to have the armor of God. And let's talk a little bit about his names. Okay? His names to kind of understand what he is about to do. The first name we can talk about is, is Satan. You've heard that name, right? And that means in Greek, the accuser. The accuser. So what does he do? He accuses us, right? And uh, what he tries to do is, um, I sometimes say that he tries to give us a spiritual kink. You say kink? Yeah. I've had a kink once in my life. Have you had a kink? For three days, I saw nothing but myself. <laughs> It was terrible. So boring. So what he tries to do is he tries to give you a spiritual kink. And then Jesus says that he's the father of lies. Okay. Because the thing is that both you and me have the old man and the new man within us. If you have received Christ, if you have received the Holy Spirit, you have the new man, your true self. The only thing that is going to last in heaven. Hallelujah. Right? The new man in us loves God above everything and our neighbor as ourselves. Right? The new man just wants to be more and more filled with the Holy Spirit. He's God-centered, not self-centered. Right? But I don't know about you, but I have an old man also. Are you perfect? 
Okay, you have that too. Uh, good news. Jesus died for that on the cross, right? So he's paid the price. So we can receive his forgiveness every day. Isn't that a good deal? Yeah, but still it's there, right? And what the accuser tries to do is he tries to give you a kink. He tries to make you focus on yourself. And, and so, so to speak, so you should create your own salvation. And then he's the father of lies. And he's a very, you say, subtle liar. He's a subtle, subtle and, and smart liar. So he tries to, you know, tell you things like this, you know, well, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting that you're here on the Breakforth Conference. Ah, oh, interesting. I mean, you, I know what you thought two hours ago. I know what you talked about with your parents two days ago. I know what internet page you looked on three weeks ago. I know how little you read the Bible. How much do you really care about other people? Don't you do everything that you do? Even when you say that you do good things, don't you do that just to get appreciation? Do you recognize that voice? He, he, he wants to give us a, a spiritual kink. So you focus on yourself and you buy into the lie that you are the biggest sinner since mankind was created. And you are the one that, you know, Jesus didn't cover when he died on the cross. Or he can, if he doesn't succeed, you know, making you buy into that lie, you know what he tries to do? He tries to give you uh, um, a, a thought, an idea that, that, okay, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. Okay. It's, you, you also are forgiven. But, you know, Jesus, he sees you as a Christian light. We have Coke light and you're a Christian light. So, you know, when, when, when Jesus looks on you, he says like, oh, you're here. Oh, 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 well, you know, I've died for your sins, but could you please, could you just be back in the corner somewhere? <laughs> That's the accuser, right? It's kind of interesting that Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is the helper, parakletos. And that was an occupation in Jesus' days, right? Uh, I don't know the English word, but uh, do you have the word defense lawyer? Yeah, so he says that the Holy Spirit is the defense lawyer. And you know, a defense lawyer has to have something to build the case upon, right? And the defense lawyer, the Holy Spirit, does not build his case upon how many good deeds you have done. He builds his case upon what Jesus did for you on the cross. That's why we can ask God to, 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 to anoint us with the Holy Spirit by grace alone, in Jesus' name, every day. Amen? That doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit wants you to sin. I think you very much understand that. It grieves his heart when we sin. We shall not do that. But his case, he builds his case upon what Jesus did for you. Not what you're doing for Jesus. It's kind of comforting. So, one of the names of the evil one is the accuser. Um, another name for the devil is the thief. That's also hard to say for Swede, the thief. And, you know, a thief, he doesn't have right to steal anything. He takes what he doesn't own, right? And, you know, I don't know any thief that comes to my house, knocks on my door and says, and I open the door and he says, you know, hello, I'm a thief. Could I, could we maybe set a time when I could come and steal things in your house? They don't do that, right? They want to come when you don't notice it. And they take things that do not belong to them. And we have to understand, he's already defeated. We don't have to be afraid of the devil, but we have to know that if we don't uh, put on the armor of God, he will steal things from us. And what he tries to steal is, he tries to steal everything that helps you to communicate with God. Because he wants to shut down your relationship with God altogether. And what do we have? I have nothing new. Acts 2.42. We have the Bible. We have the prayers. We have a community. You can say that with other Christians. And we have the Christian service and the Christian congregation. The same thing. 
And he wants to steal that. I don't know if, have, have, you, have you experienced this? That you had um, a habit, a good habit in your life. You know, the devil, he hates good habits. You had a habit in your life to read the Bible. And then suddenly every day, you had that moment, that hour, uh, or at least that moment, that, you know, 15 minutes when, when you just turned the back to all needs and all other people and you just, you were just studying the word and, and you were so blessed and you could sense the peace of the Holy Spirit being there with you. And then suddenly it disappeared. Have you experienced that? Or how many have experienced this? That, that you had a plan for the day? Yeah, in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to pray. And then you go to bed in the evening, you go like, oh, I forgot to pray. And now I'm so dizzy. Right? We have to understand that we have a thief at work. Right? Yeah. Uh, the next thing that the devil is called is the thing we heard here, the devil. And the devil, that means in Greek, the one who tears asunder, who tears apart. So he wants to, to, to tear us apart, especially us Christians. He wants to tear families apart. He wants to tear prayer groups apart. He wants to tear congregations apart. He wants to tear churches apart. He wants to tear the body of Christ in Canada apart. And man, he is at work. We have an enemy. Um, and um, Paul now tells us that what we need to do is that we need to put on the armor of God. Are you awake? Thank you. Um, and... Uh, I think I read verse 13, but I'll read it again. It goes like this, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. In the evil day, the day when you are in, an, in a special way attacked. And uh, I now want to speak a little bit about uh, how can we recognize that uh, a spiritual attack from the evil one is coming against us. Okay? Isn't that a fun subject? It's good to know. Well, I, 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 would, um, I would try to describe it like this. Um, we talked about us having a new and an old man, right? You remember that? And, and one picture we could use for that is that you and me, we all have cracks. When I look at you, you look so nice and you look so pious, you say pious, but I know that you have as much cracks as I do. C.S. Lewis, he said one time, we should look upon each other as patients on the same hospital. Okay. We all have cracks. They're just in different places. Yeah? And now listen, a spiritual attack can be recognized as an increased pressure suddenly coming against you, often in combination with you being part of God's kingdom being established on earth. Right? An increased pressure coming against you in combination with you being part of establishing the kingdom of God on earth. You're doing something that God wants you to do. And you know, if we uh, experience an increased pressure and we have cracks, where will we notice that the pressure has increased? In the cracks. And let me give you an example from my life. I fail so often, so I have so many examples. That's great. <laughs> I was driving, you know, to one place to preach. And I was, you know, 
Yes, I was going to preach about Israel and the end times. And that usually is a little bit turbulent sometimes. It's, it's great things happen, uh, but also it's a, a little bit struggle around it. And I was driving in my car and, you know, I am... <laughs> I'm afraid to say that I, I hadn't put on the armor of God. I wasn't really aware that I needed protection. I was just driving. And I was driving and I was driving towards a certain village. And suddenly, my friends, I could, I could, I could almost physically sense that pressure coming into the car. It was like, whoa, something, you know, whoa. <laughs> uh, but I didn't think, you know, because I am often stupid. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit does not want us to be stupid. <laughs> he wants you to be less and less tail, speaking Deuteronomy chapter 28, less and less tail and more and more head. Right? But I was more tail than head this day. And this pressure came in. And, you know, I was going to preach for many people like an hour from then. So I should have been realizing, you know, I, I need to pray. And if I would have done that, you know, the armor would have been there. And I would have been aware of, you know, now Hans, mind your thoughts, mind your cracks, right? Receive the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, be wise. But I did not do that. So suddenly when this pressure came in, I was reminded and can you believe it? I can have conflicts with other people. Other people can really annoy me. And you know what? Even other Christians. Isn't it terrible? They can really annoy me. So I was reminded about the conflict I had with a brother in the village where I was going. And you know what? This pressure that increases towards us is it comes in, in, you know, an unproportionate way. So I was suddenly, you know, I was so mad. I was so angry when I thought about him, I became furious. So my preparation before preaching was me screaming in the car, hollering in the car, you know, I was furious. And, you know, I had an idea. Fortunately enough, I was alone in the car, right? But I got this idea, no. I'm going to call him now. I'm going to let him know. A problem that we Christians often have, maybe not in Canada, but let me tell you about Sweden. We have a problem with bad temper. And that's one of the cracks. That is really, really a weakness when spiritual struggle comes towards us. You need to learn with the help of friends, with the help of the scripture, with the help of the Holy Spirit. You need to learn how to control your bad temper for your own sake and for the kingdom's sake. So I was so angry. I was so angry with him screaming in the car. And then, you know, a couple of minutes uh, before I was reaching the village, it was like I was woke up. And I'm going, huh? what happened? And I realized in an instant that the evil one had attacked me. And he had hit one of his arrows. You know, those fiery arrows, you see fiery? Yeah, into one of my cracks. And I was, man, I was so close to calling that person. I mean, it was like close, close, close decision not to do it. I had to use all the self-control I had because I was in flames. You think we need to learn more about putting on the armor of God? And one of the things that is connected to this is um, that Paul talks about the evil day or the day when we are attacked. You know, some days we are more attacked than other days, right? So many days in our lives might not be so filled with attacks, right? And, and it's like a boat those days. You know, you don't have too many boats maybe here in Edmonton. I don't know. But, you know, a boat, you, you take it up during wintertime. And what do you do? 
if you are a good boat owner. Yeah, you take it for maintenance. You fix it. You fix the cracks. And the Holy Spirit, I think, is going to want to help you to let him fix more and more of your cracks. Don't you think that? Because he loves you. Because he knows it's necessary if you are to be able to serve him uh, and to receive more and more gifts from the Holy Spirit. Because if you receive more gifts, you're also going to receive more pressure in your life. Hallelujah. But the Lord has won the victories. You know, it's wonderful. This is the great adventure. You know, we should go for it. Amen. But we, we need to let the Holy Spirit cooperate with us so our cracks can be fixed one after one. We won't be perfect until we get to heaven. I don't talk about that, but I talk about that, that we really can, can uh, improve here. And, and I, I can tell you one of these things that the Lord has t- spoken to me about. Two of the things um, that, that really has helped me. And maybe it's to someone here. You know, I don't say this to be judgmental. You get me right? I don't say sound this to sound like a fanatic. But I, I say this because I think uh, I should. <laughs> okay. The, the, first, the first thing was, you see, um, in my relatives, some of my relatives, former generations, um, there has been lots of problems with alcohol. And I'm a Christian leader. Might sound like a joke to you, but, but in Sweden, I'm, I'm a little bit of a leader, you know, so I, I have some responsibilities. And um, when, you, when you receive lots of assignments from the Lord, you also receive pressure. And you, you kind of have to find a way to get relief from the pressure, right? Amen? There are good ways to do that, and there are bad ways to do that. And what I did was that I... Usually drank one glass of wine Saturday evening. Fine. Then I started to drink two glasses. And then I said, you know, well, the weekend is like Friday to Sunday. So, okay. One glass on Friday, two glasses on Saturday. Well, no, you know, why, why can't I have two glasses on Friday and two glasses on Saturday? And, you know, why can't I have one glass on Sunday also? And, and you know, alcohol was filling my mind. It was becoming an idol. I was thinking about it all the time because I, I was looking forward to the week and when I could take that wine, it could relieve me from the pressure. And don't get me wrong. I'm not moralizing about people drinking a glass of wine. Okay. I, I think you understand that. But what I'm saying is that this became an idol for me. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And you know, God doesn't have a problem turning up the volume knob. So I can tell you exactly where he said it. I can take you to the very spot where the Holy Spirit said to me, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, and, and, and you, have you seen in, in the scripture that Jesus sometimes command? Isn't that kind of rude of him? Command? I mean, if we were to write the Bible in, you know, 2013 in Sweden, we would say that Jesus gives us a piece of advice. <laughs> But he doesn't do that. He commands. He doesn't force us. That's a different thing. But he commands. He really does. And the Holy Spirit commanded me and said to me like this, Hans, alcohol, stop now. (laughs) It was not like that. Oh, what did you mean? (laughs) There was only like a little whisper in my heart. I'm not really sure. I have to discern. It was not that. And I was out walking with my wife. And, you know, when we came back to the house, I, was, I, I told her, you know, um, uh, honey, I, I, um, I think the Holy Spirit just told me that uh, I won't drink any more alcohol. So that's it. And she, she knows when I say, you know, that the Lord really has said something. So she, she, was, she knew and she said, okay. Uh, and that is the way it has been since then. I haven't missed it. 2008, so it's five years, four and a half years. And one very strange thing happened then because I had a little problem with the bad temper. 
I was a little bit like a volcano. Eruption sometimes. Too bad to be close to that eruption. You know, not, not physically, but verbally. So my problem with my bad temper, it disappeared. And most of the times when I had a bad temper, it was not when I was drinking wine. I don't know the connection, but it just disappeared. And I'm not saying it's wrong to drink a wine, a glass of wine. I'm not moralizing. I, don't get me wrong. But I'm just telling that maybe you have problems, you know, maybe you have cracks that you need to work on. It can be what you look on computers. It can be how you use your words that you, you sometimes speak lots of things that are really, you know, encouraging and spirit filled and you're funny in a great way and all of that. And then you have a totally different way of using your language with some persons where you are so negative and you're so you know, condemning other people and you do not control what you say. You just let anything go out of your mouth just to ventilate your frustration. We have different cracks. And I think the Holy Spirit wants to help us. Okay? Are you awake? There you go. Let's take a look um, at the armor now. I want to read a little bit about that also, the different parts of the armor. We have 18 minutes left. So I will comment on it. And we start in verse 14, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. It goes like this. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Okay, so let's speak about the armor. And you know, this is something, um, I think the armor, we receive it when we receive the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, receiving the Holy Spirit every day. But, but you know, you, this is very practical. Paul is very practical. So, so you, if you want to do it, you can every, every morning put on the armor and think about the different parts of the armor. And let's start with the belt. The belt is the thing uh, for the soldier, the Roman soldier that kept everything together. If they didn't have a belt, everything was, so to speak, you know, you say not floating around, but, but flaxing, you say? Flopping. There you go. Flopping. Flapping. Flapping. <laughs> flapping. <laughs> flapping. Not flopping. Flapping. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Uh, and, and here he talks about the belt of truth. Truth. The Greek word for truth means the things that are not hidden. And you know, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And I usually say that he always meets us at the point of truth. Right? You remember John 4? Um, the woman uh, by the well of, you say, Sychar? Sychar's well? Yeah, Sychar's well. Uh, Jesus meets a woman. And, and that woman, you know, starts to speak with Jesus. And the Holy Spirit comes to her. And, and, and she, she is filled with longing. And she understands that Jesus is very special and unique. So she starts to open up for Jesus. And, and she's talking to Jesus. And he's telling her about the living water. And, and uh, she doesn't understand so much. Uh, uh, but, but she says, oh, I want to receive this living water. Could you please give that to me? So she's really open for Jesus. And then Jesus says to her, go and get your husband and come here. Kind of a strange thing to say. And she goes, oh, oh, you know, that was a very touchy subject. And she says to him a half lie. I don't know if you're good at half lies, but she tells him a half lie. It's not good to do that with God as a piece of advice. <laughs> She, she, says, she says like this, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I have no husband. And he just looks at her and I think he, he, you know, he's not fanatic. He's not judgmental. He's not cold. He's loving. He's warm. He will die for her on the cross. But he's also filled with sorrow because he sees all the pain in her life and in people's lives around her. And he says to her, I know that. You've had five men. 
and the one you have now is not your man. And I admire her for not running away. With tears in her eyes, she keeps standing in front of Jesus and she dries her tears and she says, I understand that you're a prophet. And she's born again. And sometimes I use the illustration of my house. In my house, we had a rule. We were very stressed. We had lots of things to do. And we had a big house. And we had a rule that the living, it was chaos in our house. Always chaos. I don't know how your house is or, or flat or whatever, but we had chaos. We had one rule. The living room was to be able to be cleaned in five minutes. So if a guest came to the main door, someone, you know, went out to the main door and tried to speak to the guest as a distraction. <laughs> the other people in the family went to the living room, cleaned it up. And after five minutes, we could show the guest in. And we just pray to God that the guest wouldn't go further into the house. <laughs> And we had different levels of catastrophe. And the worst part was the basement. It was very good. It was very, you say, steep stairs. Yeah. So if you let things down, they just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> and once a year, you know, by Christmas, it was like, you know, project getting the Christmas things. <laughs> right. Then you had to put on the armor, really. <laughs> Well, you know, what, what tends to happen with us is that we often in our lives, we invite Jesus. He knocks on the door because he loves us. He knocks on the door and we invite him into our living room. But he just loves us so much. He never forces his way, but he loves us. So he goes to the door to the basement and we go like, <gasps> <laughs> and he just asks us, my beloved friend, I need to go down there. And what he wants to do as a constant process in our lives is that he wants to forgive our sins. He wants to heal our wounds and he wants to liberate us from negative uh, things that we are stuck in. One very mundane thing is how much time we, we spend worrying. And how do I do this in a very practical way in my life? Put on the, the, the belt of truth. I'll give you two practical things that I do. Uh, not because these are the holy right things and I'm such a perfect Christian. No, I, don't, I think you understand that. Just, you know... Start your thoughts, maybe. The first thing that I do that probably most of you do much more than me, but I do it too. That is that I start every day with God. And I said, start. With start, I mean the first thing in the day is to pray to God. Good morning. <laughs> you know, I'm always tired in the morning. I very rarely feel spiritual in the morning. I feel tired and dizzy. I often hit, you know, my head in the doorpost going out to the living room. But then I go out into the living room and, and, and I have a very set order because I think order is very good. Good habits. I think the devil hates when we have good habits because that's what helps us to, to, to be free. That helps you to be free when you have habits. It's kind of strange, but that is the way it is. Believe me, I, I do lots of do lots, but I, I, I have some of the prophetic gift. That's kind of a free gift, you know, just calling people or going up to someone or speaking a message or whatever. But, but the, 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 what you say, the firmament foundation. Thank you. The foundation is the habits to do the same thing every day. That's very, very soldier like, right? You know, a soldier doesn't wake up in war. And, you know, wake up one day and go, oh, what should I do today? Maybe take a little walk in the woods first and, you know, so on. They don't do that. They ask the general, what's your command? They put on the same weapons, the same uniforms, and they keep them tidy or they will die. 
So what I do is that I pray my morning prayer. I go out. And what I do first is that I have a little adoration, the same text every day. And then I confess my sins. I have a set um, meaning to do that. And then I read. Uh, first letter to John, chapter one, verse nine. I don't know it by heart in English, but that is God cleansing us, forgiving us and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And then I say, in Jesus name, in the blood of the lamb. And, and, and I can hear, you, you talked about flapping, right? I can hear a flapping. And that is the red carpet being you know, rolled out for me. That is the carpet of the blood of the lamb. I know that I live today by the grace of the Lord. You see, and that is also the, the what did you call it? The righteousness. Uh, I have to get the English word here. Uh, breastplate. That is the breastplate of righteousness. It's not your righteousness, my friend. It's Jesus' righteousness for you. That's what you should put on. You put it on. That's protection for your heart. In Bible, Lev, Hebrew, heart. That is the center of your very being. It's Jesus' righteousness that is your protection. So one thing that I do is that I confess my sin and I receive his, his, uh, the message. I read Bible words about him forgiving me every morning. And it doesn't make me depressed. I don't feel condemned. Quite the opposite. I feel liberated, free. I receive grace and I get a bigger belief, greater belief in God's grace for me on the cross. Amen? The second thing that I do that I also really want to recommend, and it's not something that I found out. It's not my great idea. People have been doing this in, in all of church's history. I don't say it's a law. I don't say you have to do it, but that's one way that I put on the belt of truth and also the, the, the breastplate of righteousness. That is that I, every second month, I call my friend Klaus. Klaus, I think that's a very Swedish name. He's a minister, a very mature Christian. And I go to him for like one and a half hour, one hour, one and a half. And every other month um, I have that appointment, like one and a half week from now, I confess my sins. Hooray. Yeah, I want to have, the church has found out that, you know, if you ask God for forgiveness, he will forgive you instantly because he died for you on the cross. It's no problem for God ever to forgive you. If you have an open heart, if you have a humble uh, uh, approach and you ask Jesus, forgive me. So it's not God that needs for you to, to confess your sins to someone else. It is you that might need it. For me, it's so wonderful to have another human being that I trust. Don't do it to anyone. No, no, no. Do it to someone you really trust. But to have a person, in my tradition, the Lutheran tradition, to have a minister that I go to and I can tell him everything. I can tell him everything. And, and, and you know, it's not, it, it feels like, when, when, when I come into his room, I love him very much and, and we know each other and relate to each other in other you know, situations also. But when I come to his room to, 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 to say my confession, it feels a little bit like going to the dentist. Like... <laughs> But I know it's for my good. And he's not harsh. He's not judgmental. He's not cold. He's warm. He's loving. And he helps me to discern. Because I tell him that, uh, you know, I try to tell him a little bit about what has happened the latest two months. And, and you know, the things I don't tell other people. There also, lots of things that have been built up in my thoughts in different ways. And I try to tell him this. And he kind of helps me to sort things out. And he goes like, Hans, mm -hmm, um, I always have the final word on it. But, but he kind of says, you know, do you really think this is a sin? Nah, I doubt it. You know, the word says this and this and this. And the Bible says this and this. But uh, it might be some kind of wound. You might be needing healing for this. And I go like, oh, oh okay. Yeah, let's say, let's say that it's mostly a wound. But maybe not so, so much a sin. He kind of helps me to discern. And then after that, we have kind of sorted things out. Then. Uh, I confess, I kneel and I say my confession uh, and he puts his hands on me and he, he gives me the word of, of that God has died for my sins. And he starts to pray for, for, for the Holy Spirit coming to me and he starts to pray for inner healing and he starts to pray for me being liberated from negative thought patterns and other things. And man, I am never so happy as when I go from him. I dance in the spirit, sometimes also with my body. It's very Swedish to dance in your spirit, not in your body. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Okay, so that was the belt of truth, and that was the uh, uh, breastplate of righteousness. And then we go, shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And you see, this is, this is p- different pieces of the armor. So this has to mean that Paul means that if we put on these things, it will give us great protection in the spiritual struggle, right? And he talks about shoes. You know, Roman soldiers, they had big <coughs> booths. So hard to say for a Swede, but booths. Booths. Boot. Yeah, I see. They had one boot, but they had two boots. <laughs> Whatever. And, you know, they were really, they, were, they had like nails under them and they could crush everything under their feet. When the soldiers came marching and their feet were not, were not injured, right? And, and what Paul now says is the, the, these shoes is our readiness to go where the Lord wants to send us. Right? And I'm going to have Israel info here in a couple of minutes uh, together with other people. And there are two lakes in Israel. The Lake of Kinneret, the harp, and the Dead Sea. The Lake of Kinneret is filled with fish, wonderful fish. And the Dead Sea is what? Dead. Why is it dead? Because it receives water, but water doesn't leave that lake. But the Lake of Kinneret receives water but water also flows out from the lake it passes the water on you see that's what gives us life so uh, not living a self-centered life but living a life in balance both taking time to receive the lord's presence just for you he loves just you and and being in a very personal intimate way with him taking time for rest closing the door of your home sometimes to be just you or just you and the family or whatever but also see that the lord calls you to go forth with the gospel and that is something that really is so healthy for us spiritually amen yeah. And then we have, um, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, the shield of faith. Um, and um, these shields, they were constructed so you could connect them to other shields. So you could see like 1000 Roman soldiers that had connected their shields and it was like one shield moving forward kind of hard to defend yourself against that, right? So this is a, 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 an encouragement from the word that we don't need to have faith in ourselves only. We can connect with other Christians. We can, we can hook our shields to each other. And these shields were anointed with oil. So the, the fiery, you see fiery arrows? They wouldn't, you know... Uh, uh, they wouldn't uh, make the, the shields catch fire, but, but the, the oil quenched the negative fire. So we need the oil of the spirit to, to receive faith, to go forward. And I have two more minutes. Are you awake? And the helmet of salvation, you know, the helmets they had helped them to, to, to direct so they could look the right way. And, you know, this, this is all about the Holy Spirit wants, wanting to protect your thoughts. And, and the key word here is salvation. Okay. And, and we are saved. And I think every morning we ought to repeat that for ourselves because that makes us happy. I really think so. Um, so when were you saved? When will you be saved? Well, if we look in the Bible, we can answer Several different ways, and all of them, all of those I mentioned, at least, all of them I mentioned, all of those I mentioned are right. We were saved, I was saved, and you were saved 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. When Jesus died on the cross, then I was saved. He paid the full price. Isn't that something? 2,000 years before I was born, I was saved. Amen. Then I was saved when I received this in personal faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord. And I was baptized into the church. That was when I was saved. Because that was when salvation reached me. Amen. And then Jesus instructs us to pray our father. And in that prayer, we we are instructed to pray every day for salvation. That God will save us every day. 
And that's why it's so important, I think, to thank the Lord. What do you call the thing in, 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 the, in the car that you have that helps you to look back? Back mirror? Rear, yeah, that's right. Rear, I, I understood something was wrong. You know, back, no. Rear mirror. You know what? To thank God is to look in the rear mirror and to ask yourself the question, how has God blessed me? How has God helped me? How have I uh, received the Lord himself in different ways the last day, the last week, the last month, the last year, the last life? And when you look, you know, it's amazing because I don't know. Can you be in a bad mood sometimes? I'm an expert. Like this, you know, and I, I get stuck, you know, in the ground uh, with my, my eyes just going down. But when I start to thank the Lord, I see how many things I have to thank him for. And that increases my faith. Because if God has helped me yesterday, he will save me today. Amen. And salvation will be completed and fulfilled when we get to heaven. The people are standing before the throne, you know, praising the Lord. They, they no longer have the old man, only the new man. They're living eternally in a wonderful communion with God and all other people that are up there in a wonderful world that is, that is just awesome. Uh, then it says in the book of Revelation that they, they cry out and they sing to the Lord uh, that hallelujah, we are finally saved. So it's not so bad to have the helmet of salvation. And then the word, we don't have time to take the sword, but it's great to have the word of God because that is the only thing that we can use to go on the offense. Not our own words, uh, but the word of God. I mean, we can use our own words, you understand that, but, but they should be inspired by the word of God. And that's why I really would recommend you to take a little moment every day to, 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 to study that word. Don't let the thief take away your Bible reading. Amen. Bless you. Have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.